called our Big Butts series, and uh, we've been looking at excuses that we make, and we started the series by just simply saying, here's what an excuse is, and the truth of the matter is this, we all make excuses, and so I had you say last week, and I'm going to do it again this week, I want you to repeat after me, say, I make excuses. All right, very good. Now, the good thing is this. You didn't have an excuse for not waking up and coming to the church today because you were here, right? But you might, might be sitting somewhere where there's typically someone beside you, and you're like, oh, I wonder if they made an excuse. Truth of the matter is we all make excuses, and we are trying to be littered. Um, we figure we can go ahead and do the same, and so we defined what gossip is, and we said we don't want to be doing that. We want to go the opposite, and here's the answer. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs. Now, what is sometimes helpful, and we had actually looked at this in the Proverbs, it says open rebuke is better than hidden love. And uh, sometimes what is helpful as far as our communication is to be able to go to a person and say, listen, I see you going down a path that you shouldn't be going down, and I need you to understand that God's desire is for you to turn from that and turn to him. And so uh, a lot of times what we have come to mistakenly believe is that we need to just pat everybody on the back and say, well, you're okay, it's all right, um, it, I, I know that you're struggling with that sin, but don't worry about it. it Sin needs to be confessed, repented of, turned from. That's the idea of repentance, is turning. I was going this way, the wrong way. I need to turn from my sin, and I need to turn to Jesus. Uh, if you haven't turned to him as your personal savior, you need to do that first. But even if you are a believer, you need to realize, you know what? Sin, sin destroys. Uh, I was, we had our 20th class reunion uh, last night. Uh, and uh, so I traveled back to Carrollton, Ohio, where I grew up, and uh, I got to meet with classmates that, honestly, I had not seen in 20 years. Uh, I have seen one of, the, one of the girls that we were talking to, not girls, uh, like adults now, but like we were in school together, so it just is what it is. Um, so one of the classmates that, that we were talking to uh, said, you know, my dad told me like the day of graduation, take a look around because you won't see most of these people again. And I kid you not, um, I have seen less than five people until last night of the people that I had graduated with. Uh, and she said, have you kept up with anybody? I'm like, yeah, my wife. Uh, <laughs> I married my high school sweetheart, and so we are in fairly constant communication, but it was like we were talking, and the point of this is we were talking with this young lady, and, um, and she's a, a believer as well, and so we were able to share our faith together, and it was kind of neat. And uh, she was saying, you know, I'm going to a church, and, uh, and we're trying to decide, should we keep going to that church, not keep going to that church? She's like, you know, it's almost gotten to the point where nothing is sin anymore. And I said, I, I understand what you're talking about. It's very easy in our culture to get to the point where we want to be loving and we want to be accepting uh, as a Christian community because we've all grown up and we've all known those churches or those people that are so legalistic and so against everybody that it causes us to kind of try to sometimes go to the opposite extreme of just saying, well, okay, we'll, we will love and accept everyone. And that is true. But in our process of loving and accepting everyone, we still need to understand that Jesus came to save people from what? From their sins. And the moment that we get to the point where it's like there is no concept of sin, why is there ever a concept of a Savior? Just let that sink in for a second. If nothing is sin, why do you or anyone else, why does the world need a Savior? The world needs a Savior because our sin is going to send us to an eternity, if we do nothing about it, separated from God. From the beginning of time, whenever God created Adam and Eve, he created them for what? A relationship with himself and with each other. Whenever they chose to rebel against God, and we actually looked at this last week whenever we were talking about excuses. Whenever they chose to rebel against God, it created a separation between mankind and God. And God has sought to restore that relationship. He did that through sending his son, Jesus Christ, to pay for our sins. We have a sin debt. Jesus paid it. And so whenever we're talking about gossip, we're not talking about never being able to say to someone, you're wrong. What's the problem is this. Whenever I see a problem with person A, I want to talk to person B about person A. That's gossip. And so what we need to do is we need to understand our responsibility to each other. 
If you look at that person beside you, chances are, unless you came in and you sat down and just don't know the person, you have a responsibility and you're likely in relationship of some sort to the person beside you. And God calls us to be honest and truthful with them. We're going to be looking at that a little bit more today. But don't let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. Uh, last week, we looked at a history of big butts in the Bible. And uh, we looked and we saw Adam and Eve had their own big butts. And uh, they were willing to make excuses for their behavior. And you remember, Eve said, well, it was the serpent uh, who tempted me. Adam said, well, my wife, like, she gave it to me. Who was I to say no? And God didn't accept either excuse. You remember, we looked at Moses. And Moses had a whole litany of excuses. He had a whole list. And at the end of the list, after God hadn't accepted any of those excuses, Moses was just like, fine, just find somebody else. I'm out of excuses. I thought they were good excuses. Just use somebody else. And so we said, you know what, there's always going to be another excuse. Uh, there's going to be another excuse as to why you can't turn from your sin. There's going to be another excuse as to why you can't serve here at New Hope. There's going to be another excuse as to why you can't be a good dad or a good mom. There's going to be another excuse as to why as a teenager you can't live a godly life. And remember, we did kind of reference that a little bit, and that was the opposite of Adam and Eve. Uh, Noah was surrounded by wickedness. The Bible is very clear of that. And then what God said, Noah was a righteous man. So young person, teenager, I know you're surrounded uh, by those who live ungodly lives. That is no excuse for you to also live an ungodly life. And so we looked at Moses. We also looked at Gideon. He was the least in his family. And you might say, you know what? I'm the only one in my family serving God. If you're the only one in your family serving God, you know where the light shines brightest? Light shines brightest in a dark room. Okay, if you are in a well-lit room and you also bring in a light, in fact, you could almost do this, and we're not in a well-lit room, but you turn on your cell phone and you open up a flashlight app, and it's not going to do a whole lot in this room. If we would kill all the lights and there was no light other than your one solo flashlight light, it would make a difference. And the Bible says that we are the light of the world. We're a city set on a hill. And so if you're the only one in your family serving God, you know what? Your light, if you will live for him wholeheartedly, will shine bright. And so he said, listen, there was a history of big butts in the Bible. And we came to the point where we said, here was the defining thing. The presence of God trumps every single excuse that you have for not living for him, for not serving him, for not turning over every area of your life to him, for not being a good dad, for not being a good mom, for not being someone who is on fire for Jesus. The presence of God trumps all the excuses that you have. But you don't know how I've been hurt. You're right, I probably don't know your specific hurts. But I know this, our Savior who came to this earth was betrayed by one of his 12 disciples who he'd walked this earth in close relationship with. He understands your hurt. He understands uh, the way that you experience pain. He understands the world that you're living in. Uh, the scriptures tell us that he was tempted in all points like as we are, yet without sin. So the presence of God trumps all of our excuses. And we saw that God had told us, I will never leave you i will never forsake you and so you have the presence of god present in your life you have the holy spirit indwelling you if you are a believer in jesus christ got that same verse up there three times some reason guess we wanted to get that all set today in our second to last uh message on excuses we want to look at the dangers of comparison the dangers of comparison. You know what? Look at that person beside you for just a moment. You are either better, quote unquote, better than that person or worse than that person, right? And if you feel like you are better than that person, it's like, okay, I can compare myself with that person. And since I am better than that person, then I am okay. And if you can't look at the person beside you and feel like, okay, I am better or more godly or more righteous than the person beside me, you know what you'll likely do? You'll find someone else. Because you can always find someone less godly than you. Always. And it shouldn't take very long. All you have to do is walk through the doors of our church, not out the doors of our church, walk through the doors of our church, and you can find someone less godly than you. I, I say all the time, 
We are a bunch of messed up, imperfect people. And that's great. But we can be changed by the power of God. And so what happens a lot of times, even in a gathering such as this, we'll walk in and we'll say, you know what, I'm not as bad as, or so-and-so really needed to hear that, or something along those lines. And so we have the danger of comparison, and the scriptures actually talk about this in 2 Corinthians chapter number 10. It's interesting. God has a way of dealing with even the small things as we would consider them, but things that make a huge difference. If you have fallen into the trap of making comparisons and making excuses because you are not as ungodly as, this verse should help you out. 2 Corinthians chapter number 10, verse 12 says, we do not, this is Paul talking to the church at Corinth. And he's actually, uh, if you look at the, the context of this passage, he's defending his ministry. Uh, even Paul, who was a tremendous missionary, even Paul had those who were constantly attacking him, saying that he was a fake, saying that, and, and we'll read this at the beginning, saying that, you know, whenever you're up close with us, you're like really timid, you're not a bold speaker, but whenever you go away and you write us letters, then you're really bold. And so they didn't like that about Paul, and they, they often poked fun at him. And so it comes to the point where Paul says, here's the deal. We do not dare to classify or compare ourselves with some who commend themselves. When they measure themselves by themselves and compare themselves with themselves, they are not wise. It is not wise. It is not good. It is not right to compare yourself with someone else. Because whenever you do that, you fall into this danger of compromise. And it's like, okay, I don't really need to allow... And, and here's a lot of times what happens. The Holy Spirit will work on your heart. If you are a follower of Jesus Christ, you should have the Holy Spirit indwelling you. And when the Holy Spirit indwells you, He's going to work on you. And He's going to convict you. And He's going to show areas of your life. And He will oftentimes use God's Word to do that where you need to make changes. And so the goal is not to compare ourselves with someone else and say, well, I was going to completely surrender, but you know what? So-and-so, they've been following Jesus for years and they haven't completely surrendered. And so since they haven't completely surrendered, I don't really feel like it's all that big of a deal. I mean, I, 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 kind of, I read the word and I thought that that was important, but then like, it's not that big of a deal because I see that's not the way that it should work, folks. And Paul says that's not the way that we do that, and that is not wise. Because you can always, as I said earlier, find someone less godly than you. 1 Peter chapter number 1 hits on this in a rather interesting way. It says, as obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires, and I underline this, you had when you lived in ignorance. So before, there should be. You should have a B.C. to your life. And by B.C., I mean before Christ. Before you came in contact with Jesus, before he drastically changed your life and your eternity, you should have been different than what you are now. And if you are not, if there is no difference... Now, listen, if you gave your life to Jesus at four or five years of age, I get it, okay? It's hard to remember life before Jesus... I, I understand that. But if you came to Jesus afterwards, maybe in, in your teen years or in your adult years, you can look and you can say, who I was is not who I am. And if you cannot look and say, who I was is different than who I am, there's a problem. You are likely not submitting to the work of the Holy Spirit in your life. Because I know how he works on me. And I know how he convicts me. And I know how I resist. And I know this. If I resist long enough, those nudges, that conviction of the Holy Spirit, I can make it be softer and softer and softer and softer in my life until I'm almost not convicted of anything. And I, I'm afraid that sometimes in our desire to make everyone feel to a certain degree a level of comfort. I mean, one of our 
one of our core values is to provide folks a safe place to come and worship God. What we don't want to ever help you misunderstand is that in providing a safe place for you to be who you are, we don't want to ever get to the point where we say who you are is who you should always be. God's word should be active in our lives. What does it say about God's word? It's quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing of the soul and spirit, right? And the bones and the marrow, like, there's something about reading God's word that whenever you read it, you're like, oh, crud. Yeah, I really should change there, shouldn't I? Certainly had that happen in my life multiple times. Most recently on the whole um, understanding concept truth of forgiveness. Uh, my greatest hurt that I've ever experienced in my life has come at the hand of Christians. Uh, and it's tough whenever you experience hurt at the hands of Christians, those who um, should be following God. I was talking to someone throughout the week and they were telling me a similar type story. You know, every hurt that we have experienced in our life has come at the hands of Christians. And it has been tempting at times for me to say, like, they knew better. So why should I forgive them? I, and so God working on my heart to say, listen, yeah, that would make sense in your former way of life. That would make sense from a worldly perspective to say, if they have hurt you, you should hurt them. If they have hurt you, you should hate them. If they have hurt you, you should ignore them. Whatever that might be, but that's not, and that's the whole thing. As obedient children, don't conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. That person beside you is not your standard. Your standard is him. Be holy for I am holy. Sin is missing the mark of God's holiness. Romans 3.23 says what? For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We don't measure up to that standard. And, and if you're here and you have a relationship with Jesus, there came a point in your life where you realize my sin separates me from God. And so I am going to turn from my sin and I'm going to turn to God. But unfortunately, some people after that are like, well, I'll just keep living in my sin. And God says, No. As obedient children, don't conform to those evil desires anymore. Instead, be holy, for I am holy. I want you to pause for just a moment. I want you to ask yourself this question. Am I holy? Am I holy? I'm not asking you if you are more holy than, because that's where we often fall. Well, I'm more holy than, I'm, I'm better than, I, you know what, I know this person, they've been a Christian for a long time, and they've never given up that area of their life. Teenagers, it's easy to find someone in your school that you can say, you know what, they go to church and I'm better than them. They don't even go to church sometimes, and at least I'm going to church. Listen, others are not our standard. God is our standard. Be holy because he is holy. Continues on, it says, Since you call on a father who judges each man's work impartially, live your lives as strangers here in reverent fear. Why do we live our lives as strangers on this earth? This is not our hope, is it? A bigger house is not our hope. More money is not our hope. Uh, more happiness is not our hope. our hope. Our hope is found in Him. But we spend so much time consumed in the dealings of this world that we lose full sight of who God wants us to be and who we are to be in Him, and that is to be holy. Now, if we go back to 2 Corinthians chapter number 10, that's where we started, right? 
We start in 2 Corinthians chapter number 10 where it says, comparing yourselves with each other, it is not wise. I'm going to back up to the beginning of that passage and read to you. By the meekness, again, this is Paul writing in defense of his ministry. By the meekness and gentleness of Christ, I appeal to you. I, Paul, who am timid, and this is what I was talking to you about uh, before. And so I'm timid when face to face with you, but bold went away. I beg you that when I come, I may not have to be as bold as I expect to be towards some people who think that we live by the standards of this world. Now, we just said in the previous passage that we're strangers in this world, right? We don't live by the standards of this world. If you live according to the standard of this world, you are not living according to the standards of God. The standards of this world and the standards of God are in complete contrast to one another. You wonder why Christians are attacked so much for their faith? It's because the standards that God has for us are different than the standards of the world. Now, here's what there is an attempt to do. There's an attempt within our culture to make the standards of the world and the standards of God the same. There's an attempt to make the standards of the world and the standards of God the same. And what happens is this. Because our culture has said that this is okay, then it is okay regardless of what God's word says. I asked the folks at Northwestern to do one thing for me in this series. Let God's word be the unequivocal truth. Whatever God's word says, that's what we say. If it says it's wrong, it's wrong. If it says it's right, it's right. If, we should, if it says we should go this way, we should go this way. If it says we should go that way, we should go that way. Whatever God's word says, that's what we go with. If we can just come to that agreement that it, where, where the Bible speaks and the things that the Bible speaks on and it speaks clearly on and in context, we need to go with those things. But a lot of people don't want to do that. You know why? Because it doesn't fit with your quote-unquote version of Christianity. There is no version of Christianity. There isn't. There isn't like, well, there's this version of Christianity, and then there's like this version. God speaks. We have a choice to either listen or to reject, right? That's, that's where it comes down to. And I know that this message might seem a little bit harsh, um, I hope you understand the harshness comes out of God's word. Because it says, listen, we don't live by the standards of this world. And if you are living by the standards of the world, you are not living by God's standards. Because trust me, they are not meshing very well. Though we live in the world, obviously we continue to exist on this planet is what he's saying. We do not wage war as the world does. The weapons that we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. And you think about what are the weapons of the world? Like human ingenuity, like uh, being able to come up with clever methodology. Uh, Those are some weapons of the world. Uh, Technology, and I'm not saying technology is bad. Uh, at all. I have a smartphone in my pocket. I'm looking at an iPad. Uh, We're using uh, an Apple TV here. Uh, We use technology, but a lot of times the weapons of the world, advertising to try to, you think about the, the amount of money that is spent on political campaigns. It's mind blowing, really. It really is. Uh, Human reason, human wisdom, rational arguments. You know what? Sometimes God's word is not rational. It does not make sense. Sometimes it's foolishness to those that don't have Christ dwelling inside of them. Uh, Using big words, eloquent words, good arguments, well-written speeches, teleprompters, whatever that might be. Those would be weapons of the world. Human arguments, whatever that might be. On the contrary, Paul says, we have divine power to demolish strongholds. You know, Ephesians chapter number 6 hits on some of this divine power. It says that if we're going to be equipped as uh, uh, soldiers of God, so to speak, we need to have a belt of truth. And if you've ever wondered why a belt of truth, it holds everything together, doesn't it? If we start saying there is no such thing as absolute truth, then everything is morally relative, right? Right? I'm, call, I'm hoping you're processing and thinking. Some of this takes a little bit. The moment we throw out 
absolute truth and everything is relative, then there is no, if, if you say that God's word is an absolute truth, then quite honestly, there's no sense us being together. Because I've come to a point in my life actually quite a while ago where it's like, okay, I might not like what God's word says. I specifically don't like it whenever it's like saying something I need to change. Like whenever it convicts me, which it does quite frequently, it's got a good habit of that. Um, I tend to like not like it. And I'll, I'll be honest, even as a pastor, sometimes I read very quickly through things I don't like. Any of you ever read real quickly or just kind of like, ah, I'll brush that one aside, you know, I'll think about that later. I, I, I know that if I spend any amount of time, I'm going to feel conviction as a result. You've probably experienced that. Belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, right living, the readiness of the, the gospel. It says, take up the shield of faith. And it says you can quench all the fiery darts of the devil that way. You know what? Faith does a lot. It does a lot. And the devil is going to shoot those art, uh, darts at you for sure. The helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And then finally, prayer. And you can look at Ephesians 6 uh, to look at that more in depth. But instead, back to 2 Corinthians chapter number 10, Paul says, We demolish arguments in every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. You know what? There are a lot of arguments that people have as to why God's word shouldn't be present and active in your life. Well, it was written like a couple thousand years ago, and you're going to let that tell you how to live? Uh, you read this and you felt conviction on that. And so you're going to change simply because of a book. And so there are like these uh, arguments that set themselves up against the knowledge of God. And you need to be willing to demolish those. You know, whenever it talks about the strongholds, if you would go back and you would do any kind of study over, over ancient history, you would understand that cities typically had one stronghold. Sometimes entire cities were fortified in such a way. But they would have these, uh, these cities or these, this specific place within the city built up as a stronghold. And it would be hard to penetrate that. And if you were going to demolish that, it would take a lot. And it says, here's the deal. We are willing to demolish those strongholds. Those, those arguments, the pretension that self, sets itself up against God, we're going to use our spiritual warfare against that. To use anything else is kind of like using a little Nerf gun. You know what? As, as kids, even as adults, but, but let's go with the kids here. As kids, they think that it's like, you know, you shoot somebody with the, the, the Nerf gun and it hits them and they fall down. It's like, oh, I got shot. They don't understand at a young age that there are real weapons that do real damage, right? So it seems pretty cool to be able to go out and have a Nerf war. It's like, yeah, I won. Like, what a battle we just fought. Whenever you start using human arguments, you might as well be using a Nerf gun. And it might... It might win a temporary battle, but it's not going to demolish the strongholds. And so what I'm afraid is that sometimes we in the Christian community are happy getting hit with a Nerf gun, Nerf bullet, whatever it might be, a dart. We're happy because it, it makes a temporary change, but it didn't really destroy an area of our lives that needed to be destroyed. You know what? Most of us in here today have areas of our lives that we need hit, and we need hit hard. We don't need a little Nerf dart to hit us. We need it to blow it up and no longer be a part of our lives. But, like, they haven't had that happen in their life. Like, they haven't had that blow up. Listen, God wants to do a work that's greater than what we can imagine, okay? And we hold ourselves back and we hold God back many times at a distance because we say this area is off limits, God. Yeah, you can have this, but you can't have this. I will not give this to you, God. And that's wrong, folks. That's wrong. So, so he says, listen, we demolish arguments. Every pretension that sets, sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive. Check this out. Every thought to make it obedient to Christ. I was driving here today. Can you not? And I had to say, God, you know what? I don't always take my thoughts captive. Sometimes the things that I allow myself to think about, to ponder, uh, those I haven't taken every thought captive to you. And I want you to think about that. You know, we think thoughts like, 
What can be wrong with a thought? And what is being said here is you should take captive. You should be willing to demolish even if your thoughts aren't in line with Christ. That's how much God wants every detail of your life. Repeat this after me. Say, God doesn't want some of me. God wants all of me. Now here's where it comes down. God wants all of you. Will you give it to him? God wants all of you. Will you give him all? We sing songs like, I surrender all. And I'm sure that God at some times just wants to speak down to us and say, Liar! I surrender all. Liar! So here's the deal. There's always someone less godly than you. Always. And if you want, you can go about life doing this. I'll compare myself to somebody else. I'll find somebody else that's less godly. I can find plenty of teenagers that aren't living for God. Why should I live for God? I can find plenty of people in this church that aren't living for God. Why should I live for God? I've had plenty of people in my, in my life in the past, parents, relatives, whatever that might be, friends, who have said that they were following God, and then they went and they, 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 they lived ungodly lives. And so I've seen that. Why should I be any different? Here's why you should be different. The standard is God. It's not our neighbor. Lord, I, I want to pray for your people today. Even as I drove here and felt that conviction of your Holy Spirit in my own life to say, Dave, you know what? There are, there are thoughts that at times you don't take captive. There are thoughts that you don't give over to me. Dave, I want every aspect of your life. I don't want a little piece. I want it all. God, I pray for these folks today as they respond to you. Lord, that you would make some changes in their life. If they've been hit by a Nerf, nerf gun, a Nerf dart, Lord, I pray that they would be willing to allow you to blow up areas of their lives that need to be given over to you. Maybe it's their thought life. Maybe it's a place that they go. Maybe it's a thing that they watch, listen to. Um, maybe it's just being unwilling to, to serve you. Maybe it's a certain hot button, hot button moral issue that they aren't willing to say, you know what, if God speaks on this, then he has spoken and I will accept it at truth. I don't know what it is, Lord, but here's what I know. We are good at holding back from you. And we don't want to do that today. So God, make the change that you need to make. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to invite you to stand with me. You know, we don't make a, a large point of having an altar up here but we do understand or at least I understand and, and hopefully you understand the significance of stepping out and saying you know what God I, I do surrender all so I'm going to invite the prayer team down and I know that for weeks and months and maybe even years you have been comfortable in your seat I'm going to ask you to do something a little bit different today if you say God an honest assessment is that I have not surrendered all. That there are areas in, in my life that I have held back. And you say, I, I haven't surrendered all. And quite honestly, it would take just an extraordinary person to be able to say, God, you have every area. There's nothing in my life that I have not given over to you. We come into church and we oftentimes think that everybody else has it all together. It's kind of dark, but how many of you do not have it all together? All right, I'm guessing that should be a unanimous vote. So here's what I want to know. Here's what I want to know, and I'm going to have to walk out of this place. I'm already late, and that's all right. I'll drive fast. <laughs> here's what I want to know. Will you step out and say, God, I'm okay with other people knowing that I don't have it all together, and I'm okay with raising my hands and saying, I give it all to you. You know what, your boldness in saying, I don't have it all together, might give someone else the boldness to say, you know what, God, I'll give you this area of my life too. 
So if you're willing to take a bold step and say, you know what, I don't have it all together, but I want to surrender all, so demolish my strongholds, God. As I walk out, I want you to walk forward, and I just want you to respond. And if you want to pray with someone, you certainly can. And if you just want to stand here and you want to praise God and say, God, you have everything, you can do that as well. But Lord, I pray over your people that they not just stay where they are in their own little comfort zone, but that they step out in faith following you. In Jesus' name, amen.